9. You know, Miss uh, Becky handed me. Miss Becky, I apologize. It got in the inside of my Bible. And so I apologize. She'd give me a, a prayer request here for her niece. And uh, her niece is expecting a little baby. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, but her and her mom have both had a history of struggling to bring to, uh, to birth. And so let's pause we're going to pray for this precious mom and this precious little baby here tonight. He, Lord Jesus, we just come before you. And God, we thank you, Lord, for the gift of life. Life certainly is a gift from you. And Lord, it's precious. And so, Lord, we pray for this mom and this precious baby that's in her womb. Father, we pray, dear Lord, you'd strengthen her and strengthen her body. Help her, Lord, to carry this child. And Father, we pray, dear Lord, that you would just encourage her. Lord, we understand she's had some struggles in this area. And so, Father, I know her heart must be very heavy. And so, God, we pray, dear Lord, that you would help as only you can. And, Lord, please bless in Jesus' name. And amen. Amen. Please keep Miss Becky's niece in your prayers, if you would. Yes, ma'am. Just a quick praise for those who haven't heard. We do have a new Speaker of the House of Representatives. Yes, amen. Representative Mike Johnson from Louisiana. And so. Praise the Lord for that. There was a little chaos going on there in Washington. What's that? He's a Baptist. Amen. Even better. Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9 tonight. And we are in what verse, church? 27. Verse 27. You'll be happy to know this will be the, probably the last night. Now, if you listen well and we get through the message, this will be the last lesson. I do not plan a lesson prior or uh, after this on this particular subject, but we've got a lot of material to get through. We should have, be very familiar with this verse right now. Let's read it together. Hebrews 9, 27. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27. We've looked a lot and we've looked extensively about death. Uh, we have looked at uh, the cause. We've looked at the condition. We've looked at, listen, the cure. Praise God for that. Thank God. Listen, the devil, as I, I've read this week, somebody said this. Listen, the devil doesn't even own the keys to his own house. Don't give him the keys to yours. Praise Jesus right there. Listen, friend, uh, the devil is doomed to go to hell. He, uh, he does not rule and reign there. He doesn't want to go there any more than anybody else. And, uh, but it is his sure and sealed fate. Um, but we don't have to go there by the grace of God. And get an amen right there. Amen. Now, where we left off last week, uh, we spent uh, some time on that. Now, last week we transitioned to the latter part of this verse, the verse on the part about the judgment, understanding that judgment is going to come. We looked at, first of all, the judgment of the Christian, where you and I, as the child of God, will stand before Christ. And we said, listen, it's a serious thing, it's a sobering thing, but it's not a terrifying thing. This is the, this is the crowning day, this is graduation day. Uh, one of the things, if I have time and uh, uh, the Lord would so allow, bring a, les a lesson on the crowns for Christians. God specifies in the Bible five different crowns that the Christian can earn. Listen, dear friends, it's going to be a wonderful day when you stand before Jesus and a life that was well lived and a race that was well run. And he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And it's the day uh, that uh, will happen on the judgment seat of Christ for those of us who've lived for Christ. Now, one of the things we learned about this, we learned five truths about the judgment seat of Christ. Number one, we learned it was for every Christian. There is this misnomer about the professionalism of Christianity that I'm the professional and you're the uh, spectators and you guys come and enjoy the show. That is ungodly garbage, all right? That's one of the reasons why we are who we are and do what we do. We will never turn, as long as I'm your pastor, we will never turn this into a production, all right? This is a family, all right? This is the meeting where the church house, where the church comes together. We are a body, and the body works together. Now, so we learned it's for every single Christian. Number two, we learned that it's a personal judgment. You and Jesus are going to have a very personal meeting. You need to get ready for that. Number three, we found that it was our place of reward. Jesus said, behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. Listen, you ought to be looking forward to the day that Jesus comes back, and you get to hear his wonderful approval. Friend, that's what we're racing towards. That's what we're running. That's what we're working towards is the wonderful approval of our Savior. Not that we'll be approved of him. Listen, we got approved of him and in him in salvation, but to be found pleasing to his wonderful, glorious name. Now... Number four, we learned it's a comprehensive judgment. 
We learned and we discovered that there is, a, there is a spiritual essence to all that we do. God looks at all the good stuff, gold, silver, precious stone, all the, the friv- frivolous and even some of the fruitless stuff, the wood, hay, and the stubble. And there is a spiritual essence to everything that we do in this life. And God's keeping it stored up. And that's going to be evaluated. And number five, we learned that it is a serious And a motivating thing to understand we'll we'll stand before Christ. That was the judgment seat of Christ. Now, in this lesson, we're going to wrap up. We're going to wrap up. We're going to summarize the the final judgments. All right, so let's look at our notes here tonight. Number number one, the final judgments. There are three judgments, very specifically, that that God reveals to us. Number one, we've already learned about the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of Christ. Spent last week on that. We won't revisit that. Number two. Number two, where we'll take a brief time to look at this tonight, the millennial, the millennial reign judgment, M-I-L-L-E-N-N-I-A-L. By the way, I mentioned this last week, but there's already a number of folks. Uh, there's two sets of handouts that float around, the, the, the fill-in-the-blank kind that you guys all like. Uh, but several have said, Pastor, you speak a little too fast, and I get lost in there, and I get distracted. And so if you, want, if you would be like one of those, if you're one of the folks that would say, Pastor, I'd like the ones that are already filled out, just let me know. Miss Nawas is usually the keeper of all the notes back there. By the way, I forgot the prayer list on the uh, printer, uh, and so I ran back and had to get them. So she's got the prayer list as well tonight. But this, the, the, the millennial reign judgment is at the end of the millennium. And there's going to be a judgment for all who are living. We won't take, we'll look at that in a little bit more depth. And then lastly, number three, the great white throne judgment. There are three judgments that God speaks of. These comprise the judgments of the final days. All right, the final judgments. Now, let me give a disclaimer, all right? This is the dis- Pastor Rob's disclaimer on, prof- on prophecy, all right? We know that everyone will stand before God. Church, say amen right there. We've learned that extensively. Now, disclaimer. Exactly when, exactly when, and precisely how all the details will unfold is shrouded in prophetic mystery looking at the clock here it's 29 after we won't take time to look at first corinthians 15 but you will find as you study end times things or revelation many times god refers to them as mysterious or mysteries all right let me give you let me give you an illustration all right when you and i when whenever we're looking forward into something that god has prophesied about but yet has not given us absolute clarity in fact the apostle paul in first corinthians says now we look through a glass darkly all right we can see shapes outlines we can see substance but we can't see the fine details all right i'll give an illustration how many of you by when we read our bible now and we look back at the birth of christ how many of you are amazed that anybody missed it would you raise your hand you read your bible now and you're like how did they miss it all right you know why because the birth of Christ was shrouded in prophetic mystery. There were little breadcrumbs here and there. There was truth given along the way. They knew that it would come. They knew uh, somewhat about the details and the, some of it. But listen, when they were living in the middle of it, they could not discern the exact details. Now, we with the advantage of 2,000 years of hindsight can look back and go, duh, how'd you miss it? Now, I guarantee you what's going to happen is we like systematic theology. We like things to be neat and nice and buttoned up. And we like to say this is going to happen here and this is going to happen now and this is going to happen when. And we like all those clean, neat details. All right. Friend, please understand God is under no contractual obligation to explain in exact detail when, what, how, why, and where. All right. He is not. So as we look forward and as we live through these end time prophetic events, we're like, well, yeah, it kind of looks like this and it could be that. But let me tell you something, when we get on the other side of the veil and we look back, we'll be like, oh yeah, how did we not see that? All right. We didn't see it because these events are shrouded in prophetic mystery. If it wasn't a mystery, he wouldn't have called it a mystery. Amen? Now, look in here in your notes. As we look forward to these mysterious future events where, where God is clear in the Bible... We can be two things. Number one, we can be clear. Circle that word. We can be clear. Where God is clear, we can be clear. And dogmatic. Circle that word. That means that we can be 
absolutely clear and say, no, 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 this is what's going to happen, okay? Where he is clear, we are clear. Where he is not, we defer to his wisdom and trust his goodness. Understand, friend, you and I aren't going to understand every last little detail about God's future plans. Rest in that. It's okay, all right? Don't run down every podcast. Don't go out and buy every book. Don't, uh, I'm dating myself here, don't go out and buy the CD or the DVD set, all right? Listen, if it's been a mystery for 2,000 years, it's still going to be a mystery today, all right? Now, so I just want to give you that prophetic disclaimer. I always reference this book. It's a little bit dated. Uh, but how many of you are, are old enough to remember the book, 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988? Do you remember that book? All right, I remember that book. It was a hot seller in 87. It was a bestseller in 88. It was pretty much a doorstop coaster in 89, okay? All right. Once you got past 1989, they were like, well, apparently that didn't work out. All right. Listen, people are still repeating that mistake today. Now, so understand this. It's going to happen. It's going to happen in God's time and in God's plan and in God's way. But just rest in the fact that you're not going to understand every little last detail. Okay? Now, number one. So we looked at tonight the final judgments. Number two, I want to point out to this here. In the Bible, there are four distinctive resurrections. Four distinctive resurrections. Look at, let's look at them briefly on the way. First of all, the first resurrection is Jesus Christ. The, here's the word, two words, first fruits of the resurrection. Now, Jesus wasn't the first person to come back from the dead. No, no, there was a lot of people like that in the Old Testament and also in his earthly ministry. Jesus, however, was the first one in a resurrected, glorified, eternal body. His was different you see, everybody else that came back to life, that was raised from the dead in the Old Testament, New Testament, guess what happened? They died again. That would be a bummer, you know? I mean, it's bad enough if you die once. But if you got to die twice, man, I mean, that's a real bummer to go through that again. I only want to go through it once. Now, Jesus was the first one to die and to be buried and come back to life and never die again. Everybody say hallelujah right there. Now, listen, and he came back to life. As the first fruits, the first one in the eternal glorified body like you and I will share one day. So the first official resurrection is Christ. Number two is the resurrection of the church. By the way, in 1 Corinthians 15, 23, it says, But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. So number two, which brings us right into number two, the resurrection of the church. Now we often refer to the resurrection of the church as the rapture. Have you guys ever heard of the rapture of the church? All right, that, that phrasing, that wording is not in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible where you read the word rapture. It's derived from 1 Thessalonians 4. It says that there will be, we will be caught up together with him in the clouds. That word caught up is, a, is, is, is the word or rapturous, meaning to be snatched away. That's where we get the term. In biblical terms and terminology, it is the resurrection of the church. In 1 Thessalonians 4, it says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then in verse 17, it says, And we which are alive shall be caught up together with the Lord in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. In verse 18, I love, it says, It says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So secondly, and this is what we're waiting for, listen, we're not waiting for the Antichrist. We're not waiting for Bill Gates to start the one world government, all right? We're not waiting for all these things. We're waiting for, God says, he enjoins us, he instructs us. Listen, we're not waiting for the devil, we're waiting for Christ. The next event on God's prophetic time clock, and I believe if I were to give my estimation, we're at, a, we're at 1159 and the second hand is coming up real close. I believe that the, the trumpet will sound ever so shortly. The next event on God's prophetic time clock is the rapture, the resurrection of the church. Now, number three, number three, skipping forward quite a bit in prophetic history, is the resurrection of the tribulation saints. The resurrection of the tribulation saints. Go with me to the, uh, uh, the book of Revelation, Revelation in chapter 20. We'll see the next two in quick succession. Revelation chapter 20, by the way, is the last chapter of the old current world 
Revelation chapter 20 is the last chapter that con- is the concluding chapter to what we call time and space. Everything we have, everything we are, everything that exists, at the end of Revelation chapter 20, it's gone. And Peter talks about the fact that these world, this world and all the others shall burn up with a fervent heat. All right, That happens at the period in Revelation in chapter 20. Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22 is God makes all things new. All right, So the conclusion of this sin and Satan cursed world and universe happens in Revelation chapter 20. Now notice with me in Revelation chapter 20 and verses 4 and 5. He says, I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them, meaning they were given authority and power. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, nor in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ. How long, church? A thousand years. All right, this is the resurrection of the tribulation saints. Lastly, number four, number four, the last and final uh, specifically mentioned revel, uh, resurrection is the great white throne. The great white throne. Notice with me, same chapter, look at verses 12 and verse 13. Now pause, everybody look up here. Okay, let me give you to the best of my understanding, biblical understanding, the events of prophetic future. All right, the next thing to happen is the rapture, the resurrection of the church. Christ will return. He will return in the clouds, all right? That is the, his coming for his bride. Christ's feet do not touch upon this earth until later. He comes in the clouds. The trumpet sounds. The dead in Christ are raised first. I always give you that little joke because they have six feet farther to go, all right? And, uh, and then the, the living Christians are, are caught up together with him. We are transformed. 1 Corinthians 15, this mortality puts on immortality. We are escorted up to heaven where we're with the Lord evermore, all right? I believe that in that intervening time is where we will experience the judgment seat of Christ. The next thing that happens with the resurrection of the church or the rapture of the church is the start of the seven-year tribulation period, Daniel's 70th week, the time of trouble, all right, where uh, literally all hell is going to be unleashed on this world. The Antichrist uh, in Thessalonians says that he that now letteth, that means that Holy Spirit that's restraining the work of the, the devil, he says he will be taken out of the way. Listen, where is the Holy Spirit? You know where the Holy Spirit? He's in you and he's in me. This great salting, sanctifying presence of God's people all over the planet is going to be gone in a second. In fact, faster than a second. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. One one hundred thousandths of a a, a blink, all right? By the way, that's why it's a fallacy to say, uh, I'm just going to wait to the very end and I'm going to get right with God. It's going to be too late, friend, all right? Too late. The rapture of the resurrection of the church. The seven-year tribulation period. The end of the seven-year tribulation period, Jesus returns on white horse with us. Revelation chapter 19, all right? Every, uh, Satan is put down, bound, thrown into the bottomless pit for a thousand years, all right? Uh, he then sets up an earthly kingdom for 1,000 years. The folks that deny the millennial kingdom, I just, they didn't take their meds this morning, all right? I don't understand how they come up with that conclusion. It's clearly in the Bible, all right? At the end of that 1,000 year period, all right, the very conclusion of that is the millennial judgment, all right? We can get in Matthew chapter 25, all the living nations, all the living people, all right? At the end of that, or I'm sorry, pause, all right, pause. At the end of the millennial reign, the 1,000 years, the devil is loosed, all right? There's a simmering rebellion going on, Psalm chapter 2, why did the heathen rage? Why do they uh, gnash their teeth? Why do they reject uh, the Lord and his Christ? Uh, listen, there's a, uh, I'll get into that in just a moment. Satan brings out one last worldwide rebellion against God, against the Lord Jesus enthroned in Jerusalem. The Bible says the whole world, all of the lost world, surrounds New Jer- Jerusalem in the camp of God. Fire comes down from heaven, wipes them all out. Okay, now. At that point, we have the judgment of all living at the end of the millennium. Then we go into the last and final judgment, the great white throne judgment. That's the judgment of the dead. We'll have the judgment of all living. Then you'll have the judgment of all dead. And then you have Revelation chapter 21, all things are new. All right, this is a brief overview, all right? Now, let's go back to the notes here. 
All right, now, so that gives you an outline of the four, give you just an overview of the four resurrections that the Bible speaks of. Now, you might have noticed one particular group that's missing in there, all right? What happened to the Old Testament righteous people? What about Noah and Abraham and Moses and Miriam and Aaron and all them folks, all right? That's a really good question. Remember how I said at the very beginning that um, there are certain things that are mis- uh, a mystery, Certain things that aren't clear. One of the things that, at least to my satisfaction, is not 100% clear is where will the Old Testament saints stand in their judgment? They're all gonna, we're all going to stand before God. Now, I, there's two strong possibilities, at least in my mind, as I understand. Number one, they're included in, the, in with the church. It's the resurrection of the just. Uh, and I they believe that's very plausible. All right? Now, the other time, it would be, at the, uh, would be the great white throne. Because the Bible says that, that they that are in the Lamb's book of life get to go to heaven. Well, that means there's some saved people there. And they that are not in the Lamb's book of life, they don't get to go to heaven. So there's some lost people there. All right? This is where I'm going to say, listen, in my mind, to my satisfaction, it is unclear. It's a mysterious thing. All right? I believe there's a very strong argument that they'll be included in the resurrection of uh, the just, the resurrection of the church. All right? We like things very dispensationally. That it's the Old Testament, it's the New Testament. Uh, I don't know that God works in, in such clearly defined lines. But anyway, I just want to give you that. Now, let's look here let's say as, we, as, we, as we now wind our way down. So we've looked at the judgment seat of Christ. We understand the resurrection of the church. And then we're going to have the seven years of tribulation. Then there's going to be the 1,000 year reign of Christ. Now, notice with me in your notes, the millennial kingdom judgment let me give you this here not everyone here's the next thing you want to write in not everyone will die in the tribulation how they make it through it's just by the grace of god all right there's a lot of people most of the world dies in the tribulation now not everyone will die in the millennial kingdom you say pastor how are they going to live for a thousand years it's going to be a different time god says very clearly that uh, that that it will be different during that time you'll be able to uh, a little child can play on the hole of a snake and be bitten don't bother uh, there, there will be a different difference in that time let's just put it there all right now during the 1000 year it's the next thing we're gonna, during the 1000 year period of peace and prosperity in the millennium the world's population will again blossom understand there's going to be people that will live through the tribulation normal natural people They will be born, they will live, they will marry, they'll have children, and for a period of a thousand years, so the population is going to be redundant or uh, reestablished again after the tribulation. Now, people will live, have children, work, retire, and some will pass away. Now, during this 1,000 year millennial kingdom, the reign of Christ, there will be global leadership under Jesus. Somebody say hallelujah right there. Oh man, I can't wait for that day, all right? Each nation, state, county, and town will be ruled under the righteous leadership of the resurrected saints of God. The Bible says we will rule and reign with him. Life will go on in a brand new normal for 1,000 years, all right? At the end of that 1,000 years, Satan is loosed for a short time. There is a simmering rebellion of sin that still lingers in the hearts of mankind, of those who were born in the millennium, and will follow him, will follow Satan in his final rebellion against God and the Lord Jesus. Hold your hand here in Revelation chapter 20. Go with me to Psalm chapter 2. This is a psalm of the millennium, the millennial reign of Christ. Notice with me in Psalm chapter 2, a prophetic psalm. The Bible says, and God says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Remember, during the millennium, he will rule and reign with a rod of iron. He says, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. This is not just prophetically fulfilled in David. This is fulfilled in Christ. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance. And the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. 
Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Listen, friend, that's not the age of grace. That's the millennial kingdom. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. Now notice with me, go back with me to the notes here. Outwardly they have complied, worshipped and pledged their allegiance and love, but inwardly they have craved to overflow, overthrow and enjoy the pleasures of sin. Listen, every wicked, immoral, godless thing is going to be put down in the millennial kingdom. All right? Satan leads a final doomed assault against the Lord and the saints of God. And this is Revelation 18 and 19, and, and is utterly and swiftly defeated. We think of this great cosmic raging battle. No, the Bible says the heavens open up, fire comes down, everybody dies. Period, end of story. Okay, moving on. All right, like, like literally one sentence, all right? The whole battle of the world is done, all right? Listen, we get this idea that God and Satan are in this huge cosmic arm. There is no arm wrestling match. Jesus is the winner, the devil is the loser, end of story. All right, now. With that being in mind, all right, I want you to go with me, all right. Now, after, listen, after the final defeat of Satan, the Lord, Jesus, sits enthroned with his only angels around him, and judgment is made of the living nations. Pause there. Go with back with me to, uh, to uh, Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. I want you to see this. This is where a lot of people get salvation really messed up. Look at verse 31, all right? If we do not understand, in your notes here, there's a word, doctrinally, all right, doctrine. Two words I want you, I want you to, it is important to understand doctrinally, that means what you understand, what the Bible teaches, and I want you to uh, circle that word doctrinally, once you write it down, then I want you to circle the word dispensationally, Dis, excuse me, dispensationally, that means a, the period of time that God is dealing with, it's a, a dispensation is a period of time. If we don't understand that Matthew 25 is the judgment at the end of the millennial kingdom, when Jesus has physically been here, he has established his rules, his laws, his expectations, been very clear for a thousand years. No excuse. Everybody knows. It's really clear. If you make Matthew chapter 25 the church age, you get salvation really squishy. All right? This is where people misapply and misunderstand. They think, well, you know what? How do you get to heaven? Well, you do good works. And you take care of the poor people, and you be really nice, all right? And my good outweighs my bad. That's how I get into heaven. That sounds like Catholicism and also Islam, all right? That's where they get it from. Now, notice with me in Matthew chapter 25, he says, When the Son of Man shall come in his, what? Glory. This is not his first advent. This is his second coming, all right? This is Revelation chapter 19, his full unmasked glory. This is when he sets up his thousand-year kingdom and all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon his throne in his glory, all right? And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another. This is the living at the end of the millennial kingdom, as the shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left hand. And then shall the king say unto them in his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared from you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink? And when, uh, when saw we thee a stranger and took thee and are naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came to thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And then shall he say unto uh, them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungered, and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you took me not in. Naked, and you clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and you visited me not. And then shall they answer and say unto him, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, or thirst, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? And then shall he answer and saying, Verily I say unto you, as much as you have did it not unto one of the least of these, you, have not, you did it not unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, 
but the righteous unto life eternal. Please understand that this is the final judgment for the living at the end of the millennial kingdom. Listen, it is going to be very clear how God expects people to live. This is going to be their, the, the righteous, the manifestation of their faith. Abraham in the Old Testament was saved by faith and looking forward to the Messiah and understanding and believing the promises of God. We are saved by faith and looking back to the cross and to Christ and his work on Calvary. They were saved by faith in the Old Testament. We're saved by faith in the New Testament. Listen, they're still saved by faith in the millennial kingdom. Their faith is demonstrated through faithful obedience to God's clear commands. Understand that? Everyone is saved the same way, no matter what time period. It is saved by grace through faith. It looks slightly different in these different time periods, but it's still by faith and through grace. Understand, if you get this, if you make this the church age, then we're all saved just by being good and nice and helping poor people. That's not what the Bible teaches. Understand God is dealing with a very specific time, a very specific place, and a very specific set of circumstances. That's the judgment at the end of the millennium. Now, go with me now back to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation in chapter 20. We see here the final judgment. So the Christians have been judged. The living at the end of the millennium have been judged. Now we get to the judgment of every dead person, or at least every dead lost person, all right? Every dead lost person, because the dead in Christ have been already raised, all right? Now, notice with me, in Revelation in chapter 20, as which I have already said, which is the great conclusion chapter to our present life and world now, notice with me, starting in verse 12. I'm sorry, in verse 11. In verse 11, it says, And I saw a great white throne. That's why we call it the great white throne judgment. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Can you imagine the very glory of God would literally repel, physically repel, the sin-cursed earth away from him. The brightness of his glory is such that this sin-tainted world, the globe, the planet, will literally flee away from his glorious presence. I want you to absorb that for a moment. Now notice with me, the Bible says here in, in verse uh, 12, and I saw the who? The dead. So it's clearly this is the judgment of the dead. We looked at the judgment of the living in Matthew 25. This is the dead. Small and great. It's talking about their stature. Stand before God and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written therein, uh, written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. The second death is the permanent death. Death being separation. This is the permanent separation from God. In verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. When you read that period at the end of verse 15. That is the conclusion of the universe and the world you're sitting in. Notice with me in verse 21. Chapter 21, verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. There was no more expanse, no more separation between heaven and earth. Now, notice with me very quickly in our notes here. The great white throne judgment. This marks the very final judgment of all mankind. This is a great and dramatic conclusion of the present sin-cursed universe. After this final decisive judgment God will recreate all things making the heavens and the earth new again without the present curse and taint of Satan and sin somebody say glory to God right there imagine a world listen imagine a world where there is not even the presence of evil there will never be a time where you will ever be exposed to anything that is less than completely 100% to the glory of God you will never have a bad thought you will never even want to say a bad word. You will never have a desire in your heart to do anything but live for all eternity for the glorious glory of God Almighty. You will never hear a lie. You will never be exposed to immorality. There will never be sin ever again. Can you imagine 
Man, my friend, listen, forget about the gold and the stones and the rubies. Listen, friend, living in a world where we will never disappoint God again, that's heaven, friend. Now, notice with me. Let's give some details. Jesus will be their judge. Who is the God sitting on the great white throne judgment? In John chapter, we don't have time, but I encourage you to look at John chapter 5, verses 19 through 29. Jesus spells out the judgments of the end time. Jesus will be their judge. Very clearly, he says, the Father hath given into his hand all judgment. Number two, the word of God will be the standard of eternal judgment. What will they be judged against? They will be judged against the living word of God, the, 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 the words of God, all right? And very clearly in uh, chapter, uh, chapter, verse 48. The dead, you see what I write in there is the dead. Now, I, I didn't put in a lot of blanks in here because I figured we were going to be running out of time. The dead are raised. You read that in chapter verse 11 and 13. The books will be opened. This would clearly be all the unrighteous dead from Cain, the last unsaved person who died in the millennial kingdom of Christ. Most likely those that were, dead, that were killed in the just preceding battle of the great battle of Armageddon that was just wiped out by God. All right, Imagine Cain standing in the front of that line. Imagine what that's going to be like. I, I can't even imagine. Can't even imagine. It could, now this is, again, I make a great disclaimer, all right, great, so this could also be the place of the judgment of the Old Testament saints. Those that stand before Jesus are judged according to the things recorded in the books. It says that two times, or multiple times in this passage. Those not found in the Lamb's book of life are cast into the lake of fire. Hell is not people's eternal destination, the lake of fire is. Hell is actually cast into the lake of fire, all right. Those in the book of life are received into the eternal kingdom of God. It's where we have the, uh, the possibility or the thought that's not just lost people here. But there are some lost people and some saved people. Now, the question then comes up, well, Pastor, what are these books? All right, let me give you some thoughts on that. What are these books? The Bible reveals that God keeps very extensive and accurate records in heaven. Some of the books that may be opened would be, now these are some of the books that are written or recorded in the Bible. The book of the law or the book of the Bible. All right, we understand that this is the word of God that will be the judge, will be the, will be the judgment evaluation or the yardstick. Number two, the book of words. Matthew chapter 12, Jesus says that man shall give account for every idle word. You know what that means? It's been written down. In, uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, it talks about the book of deeds. It talks about the fact that everything done in the body will be judged. There is a book that records that. In Psalm 56 and verse 8, it talks to the book, uh, David specifically mentions the book of tears. And every time you shed a tear in this wicked world, in this, heart, in this, this sin-soaked world, God keeps track of that. That's a good God. The book of remembrance. This is one of my favorites. Go with me to the book of Malachi. Uh, you, you find the book of Matthew, and you just go right over the divider. This is probably one of the most precious promises in all the Bible for us, the saved of God. Look with me at Malachi in chapter 3. There is more in the book of Malachi than just tithing, okay? Just in case you didn't know that. Malachi chapter 3. Look with me in verse 16. I love these verses. In verse 16 and 17, then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. That's why God's people ought to hang together. That's why God's people ought to get together as often as they can. And the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. I love this. This is God speaking. And they shall be mine. What does God think of you? And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts. In that day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man that spareth his own son that serveth him. Everything about that, you are a particular, peculiar treasure to your heavenly father. But the book, very, very possibly the book of remembrance will be open. And of course, the book of life will be open. Now, I gave you some information there in the book of life, but we must close. What is the book of life? The book of life, just very quickly summarized, is the book to whom God... Specifically, the Lamb of God has given life. I gave you four, very, uh, four uh, biblical uh, references there to the book of life. You can look that up. Friends, God is going to bring every work into judgment. Understand that it's a serious thing. We need to be busy about telling people, getting people ready. Let's pray. Father, we come before you tonight. And Lord, thank you for the, um, Lord, the, uh, the, the attentive listening of your people. But I pray that in... I was able, Lord, to communicate the truths 
uh, Lord of this time and Lord of the final judgments in an understandable and cohesive way, and in a comprehensive way. And Father, I pray, dear Lord, as we are informed in our faith, God, I pray, dear Lord, that we would be sobered with the seriousness of judgment. And Father, we pray and ask, dear Lord, that we would live a life ever ready, living rapture ready, ready for the trumpet to sound every minute of every day. It is a life-changing way of life. And so, Father, we thank you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll stand to our feet tonight, heads bowed, eyes closed. Musicians playing one verse of invitation tonight. There is something you need to play.